Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of the country's biggest stars and some of my favourite people. And we've got one for you today. Brian McFadden is releasing his brand new solo album, Otis. It's out on November 2nd. And I'm delighted to say that he joins us on the phone now. How are you doing? Hello, Alex. How are you? Do you know what? It must be great to be you. I mean, to have a career is one thing, but to keep a career is quite another. And you've lasted the test of time, really, haven't you? Yeah, well, 20 years now. Um, I think I've surprised myself. To be honest, I'm still around. You know, when I, when I obviously I was in Westlife for six years, and that was you know back in 2004 I left the band, and to think that you know all these years later I'm still somehow releasing albums and still touring and still doing gigs, you know, nearly at the age of 40 this day, so I'm pretty I'm pretty happy with, with how everything's done. Our lives are pretty similar. I'm 38. We're not far apart. I mean, what an amazing time that was in the 90s for music, and you were at the heyday of it. I guess just surviving that sane is the biggest achievement, really, because it's overwhelming to have that level of success. I mean, it was global. It was huge, wasn't it? And, and for us, very quick. I think that was the, the strange thing for us. You know, a lot of bands that, that go on to kind of have that success, they kind of have a slow build-up where they might start by doing small tours and release the music that's not successful and eventually something works. But for us, it was so instant. Our first gig was supporting Boyzone in like Wembley Arena and, you know, in, in the, the Manchester Evening News Arena, places like that. Where we, we started at the very top and our first single went straight to the one. So we never had that chance to, to prepare ourselves for what was ahead or to, to be ready. It just happened. And it was literally like a hurricane. Does it ever become normal when you wake up and find yourself on the front of a newspaper or headlining an arena? I mean, these are strange things that the average person will never, ever encounter. It is weird. Because we were so young, it, it had become quite a normal thing for us. You know, we spent most of our life doing gigs. So, um, yeah, no, I, I do remember that where being on the front of a newspaper, which is, if you're on the front of a newspaper, you've done something wrong, normally. Yes. Um, but you do just get used to it. You know, you mm. kind of get used to if you do something right. Like when I was a kid, if I did something wrong, my mum would give out to me and I'd be in trouble. But mm. when I did something wrong when I was 18 and, and older, I was on the front of the paper. So you, you do get used to it. Mm. And just finally on the Westlife thing, before we talk about you, will we ever see you boys back together doing the show? I mean, that's what everybody's waiting for and wanting. I'll be honest with you, I don't think it's going to ever happen with the five of us again. I think we've, we've kind of gone too far um, over the years away from each other for it to happen. I do I do have the feeling that they will probably get together next year. Next year is a 20-year anniversary of us. Mm. I, I would say the four of them will probably get together, but I don't think it'll... It's, it's definitely not on the cards, and I don't think it will ever happen that the five will be together again. Is it just that you're done and you don't want to be part of it, or is it that you believe in looking forward and not back? Uh, no, no, not at all. I, I wouldn't have a problem. I, w- I would love to sing with the boys again one day. I just think we've we've gone in different directions. You know, the, the Westlife were, t- were a four piece twice as long as they were a five piece. You know, so mm. I think they see themselves as a four piece rather than a five. Um, so I, I just think it's you know it's it's been too long now and too much has happened and. I think the gap has just gone too much for everything together. Mm. Let me talk about you a bit. I, the, here's my impression of you. I think you have incredible decorum, and I think you're very classy what you've dealt with throughout your career. You live your life privately, and you keep it that way even when others don't. Was that always deliberate? Because I always had great respect. At a time you were almost being baited by the press, you always kept your mouth shut, didn't you? That can't be easy. It was, it was difficult. It's very difficult to read something about yourself. That's not true. Because the first... Yeah, your initial reaction is to, to jump, jump up and say something and say, well, that's not true, and get yeah. attacked back. I guess it's got, it's got a little bit more difficult than recent years with social media, because now you say something about you, that's not going to straight away. Um, whereas in, in the old days, like, you know, you have so much time to think about it because you've got to give a quote, so you could calm yourself. Um, it's a little harder to do that now. It's, people do bait you quite a lot of social media to, to get a comment and get something out of you. Is social media good? I mean, what it does do is bring you immediately close to your fans so that you can get a message to them, but it also brings the haters closer to you and they can react back, doesn't it? Yeah, well, look, to be honest with you, if you think about, about social media, you know, you don't have to read comments. Mm. You know, comments are there. They're not, you're not forced to read the comments. For, for me, social media is fantastic. As you said, yeah, first of all, you get to have a direct connection with your fans. Second of all, you know, in the old days, you would do an interview with a journalist, and then you would be praying that they would would, would rewrite exactly what you said and how you mm. said it. Whereas now, with social media, you say exactly what you want to say, and that's it. Nobody can mess it. Nobody can edit what you say. No one can twist it. So in that way, it's good. It's good to have that that 
you know, that freedom to be able to speak whenever you want. Yeah. People, people do get upset because there's trolls and stuff on social media, but you don't need to read them. No. You don't have to read them at all. You just ignore them. Right, let's talk about this new album. You're going to be appearing at the Boysdale Club in Canary Wharf the 6th to the 9th of November, debuting this brand new album called Otis. I mean, Otis Redding, legend, obviously, but why is he so special to you that you wanted to make a, an album in tribute to him? Well, I was, I was making a soul album. It was always my plan this year was to do a soul album, put together an incredible soul band and make a soul album. And when I was researching all the songs I was going to do, everything just kept coming back to Otis for me. You know, when I put the list of songs that I wanted to do, pretty much all the songs were Otis. So I just decided, you know, I just go the whole way and just make this album all about Otis. Because the beauty of all Otis as well is we all know his, his, his big hits. But there's so many hidden gems that people don't know. And some of these songs that I've done now, I, I was so surprised when I recorded them that I couldn't believe that these songs hadn't been hit and, we, and I hadn't heard them before. There's, you know, besides being, you know, the king of soul, it's also an amazing pop player. Some of these songs have incredible pop melodies and, and they would sit right on radio now until they were released. Mm. Um, so I found it quite surprising. So it was exciting for me to be able to almost give give songs a, a, a new release of life and maybe that people that have never heard all this ready put kind of back out give them a chance to hear them and if we look what he went through, I mean, to be a successful artist of colour back then must have been tortuous. What a life and existence and success story out of it. Yeah, absolutely. But you, you can hear it in his music, and that's, that's the beauty of it. Because I was talking about this to someone the other day, I was saying, when I was listening to this song, when I wrote down the lyrics, you realise that the lyrics are actually secondary to Otis. They don't really, they're not important to the lyrics that Otis is singing. It was how he was singing. All his emotion, all his heart, all his blood, sweat, and tears is in, is in the way he sings the words, not the actual words he sings. Like, I, I remember looking at one song, and there was only four lines for the whole verse, but the verse was a minute and a half long. Mm. He filled it in with these sounds, these emotions, and, you know, when I, I, I had to scrap that song because I was like, I can't do that. I can't fill in trying to mimic what Otis is doing there. You can't do that. Only Otis can do that. Right. That's always the risk, isn't it, that people will compare. Your voice right now, it seems to me it's richer than ever. It has a resonance that you're never going to have at 18 and 19. You must be thrilled with it. As you get older, it does sort of fill out, doesn't it? And you've got a beautiful voice, instrument there. Well, my voice has got better for, for a couple of reasons. But I think the years of, of, of badness, of drinking alcohol and smoking cigarettes, which I did for a long time, it, it, it gave me this kind of grass, this wear and tear in my face. But I stopped smoking three years ago, um, and I think that has made my voice better now. Now I'm actually, it, my voice is at a certain stage, but I'm able to maintain it now because I'm not drinking as much, I'm not smoking at all, and I, I'm finding it more easy to use my voice and, and be in control of it, and, uh, which is one thing I wasn't able to do when I was smoking. So. Giving up cigarettes is the best thing I ever did for my voice. Help me with this, Brian. I'm a deeply unattractive man and always have been. What's it like being a nice bit of trouser and a sex symbol? I mean, it's got to be intoxicating, right, when you're 25 and you're the hottest guy in the world? Well, I think what it is, is it's not, it's not about being good looking. I think it's just when you're in a boy band, for some reason, people think you're good looking. To be honest with you, if I had to be in the West Coast, I would probably... Uh, still be a virgin, never have it married, uh, you struggle. <laughs> but there's nothing about being it just gives you this gloss and people have some kind of goggles and they see you different. If you really think about it, if you look at uh, look at Westlife, look at Boyzone, look at One Direction, if you think about it and look at them deep down, I'm not really as attractive as people make out. <laughs> <laughs> Except Harry Styles, he's quite a handsome chap of friends. What about life on the road? Is it torturous? I mean, I used to talk to you guys back in the day and you'd be schlepped in and out of radio studios, then you'd have to do 13 gigs, then you'd fly to Hong Kong to do another gig, you'd fly back and have to talk to another idiot like me. It's a hard life. I know it might seem fun on the stage, but is that one of the reasons that you're just done with it? Because it is exhausting, isn't it? But it's a, it's a job, you know, it's like everybody else. People have the jobs, they get up in the morning, they go to work. That is my job. That's what I do. I get up in the morning and I go to work. And mm. For me, I get up today, I speak to you on the radio and I'll do a couple more interviews today and then I'll get on a plane and I'll fly to Singapore and I'll do a gig tomorrow night. But that is my day job. That's what I right. do. And it's just, it, you just get used to it. Yeah, it's all part of it. Is it still as thrilling standing in front of the audience with the pin focus and, and opening your mouth and they're immediately enchanted by your voice? That's got to be a thrill. It is. And, and you know what? It never gets old. It's been 20 years now and Every time I start, it's, it's the bit you look for. The, the other stuff that goes with it, you know, the, the TV interviews, photo shoots, all that stuff. I, I'm not a fan of that, but it's all worth it. 
when you get out on that stage, as soon as you step on the stage, it just makes you realise all mm. hard work is worth it. And talk to me finally about being a dad. Is there any greater joy compared to the new album or anything like having a hug from your kids? No, definitely not. You know, they make it, they make it all worthwhile. Um, and they're not kids anymore. My kids, my oldest is 17 now. Yeah. She's, a, she's a full grown adult. It's crazy to think that, you know, she's almost the same age as I was when I had her. Wow. So that's, that's kind of scary. Yeah, incredible. And what's it like when they stand in the wings and watch you do what you do? Is that thrilling or is it slightly intimidating? Because they're going to be the most honest. They're going to give you the hardest review of anybody, aren't they? You know, it's funny enough, they like it. They were, they were probably too young to have the Westlife songs. You know, they were only babies when I was in, in Westlife. But mm. obviously with stuff like YouTube now, they've, they've, they've been on YouTube, they've seen all the videos, watched all of the performance. So they're well brushed up on my, on my career. Um, they love coming to the shows now, you know, especially when, when Keith and I do the boys' dive shows and we, and we do tell stories and stuff. They love that. They love to hear all the old stories. Mm. But, uh, you know, they're, they're the biggest fans, you know. And as a guy who was born and raised in Nottingham, I'd like to apologise on behalf of our road system here where we like to penalise people. Everybody here has a ticket because they don't like you going more than three miles an hour. And I hear the judge told you that you should get a lift from one of your fans to your gigs when he saw you last week. <laughs> Look, I want, I want to apologise to the people of Nottingham for breaking the speed limit. I've got my and I want to drive the six months. Yeah, that was a bit of a strange thing. It wasn't the judge, it was the prosecution suggested that I tweet out and ask for uh, my fans to give me lifts to the gig. I've got huge respect for you and your voice and I think you always keep it classy and I think what you've been through over the last two decades it puts you in this place now to stand on a stage and attempt these incredible songs with this new Otis Redding album which is out uh, in November congratulations on everything we'll talk again in person and film something for, film something for YouTube because uh, I know your fans would love to see it thank you for your time Brian yeah, brilliant thanks a million I'll talk to you again soon